in him. And Bennett, I think, has heard enough this morning. But um, there's a spirit of the Lord here that's important to maintain during the preaching. Don't just turn it off and sit back, but let the spirit that's surrounded us continue to move in our hearts as the word of God comes. Brother, Brother Clay Jack. We just lift our hands and love the Lord together. He's been so gracious to manifest himself among us with his presence. Why don't we acknowledge that today and thank him for being here. Lord, we love you and we adore you. We're thankful for who you are and what you're doing. We acknowledge today that you are God of gods. You are Lord of lords. You are King of kings. We love you, King of glory. We praise your name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ellensworth, for those words and for the opportunity to minister today. Um, we will likely offer you um, an opportunity to participate more in a seminar format uh, to explore how we look at mental health and uh, wellness and how the scripture uh, squares with some of the things that we're learning from contemporary science about how to maintain a sense of wellness and, and to avoid some of the anxiety, the fear, the discouragement, the depression that seems to be so much part of our world. Pastors already acknowledged that we are um, in a new reality. Pastor Glenn has said that we are moving toward normal, but studies show us that 20 to 30 percent of folks who uh, contract COVID have subsequent mental health problems. And of those who already struggle with mental illness, about 30 to 40 percent of them experience a, a real um, intensity rise in their symptoms. I believe personally from a spiritual standpoint that Satan is doing everything he can to hinder every person who is created in the image of God. And so if you can pinch yourself and it hurts, you qualify. And then for those of us that have been filled with the Holy Spirit and we have taken on the name of Jesus, the target on our back is larger because we represent something that the enemy hates and that is the glory of God manifest in the world. Paul called it the hope of glory, which is Christ in you. And so we should not be surprised if we face significant challenges. Jesus told us that in the end times that men's hearts would fail them because of fear. And that doesn't just have to do with physical heart attacks. It has to do with the courage that we feel to stand up for the truths of the Word of God and the presence of the Spirit of God. But I, for one, am glad and I'm happy that Jesus also told us, don't fear. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But you don't have to fear because I have overcome the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How many are thankful today that we serve a living God and he knows how to keep us, he knows how to bring us through. You know, he's, he's put his people through Red Seas before and he's, he's moved Jordan Rivers before and, and, and Lazarus was dead four days. But when God gets involved, the end of the story is going to be greater than the beginning of the story. How many are glad that he is the author and the finisher of your faith? Amen. I, I want to take just about three minutes here, and I want to, to do a duty and give you a report. Uh, the duty is I want to thank you, I want to thank you as a congregation for your support of Arlington United. It is a daughter work of this congregation, so if you didn't know, uh, you're a mother today or, or a, a father, because there's a daughter church that's happened because of this congregation. Uh, your financial support, your prayers, your attendance intercession, your emotional support uh, for, for us as a ministering family has been exemplary and it has not been without results. The Lord is doing great things in Arlington and usually when you measure church plants it's kind of A, B, C's, attendance, building and cash and I can tell you that, uh, that the Lord is blessed in, in all aspects. Our people, uh, just as Pastor Ellensworth mentioned here uh, regarding Finley, our people at Arlington are giving people, they're generous people. It seems the less we say about money, the more they give. So I'm considering not even talking about it too much at all. They're just very faithful, and the Lord has blessed us in that regard. 
We also are seeing revival. We have about 20 to 25 people that gather uh, with us and consider themselves part of our home congregation. And in the year 2020, we saw three people baptized with the Holy Spirit uh, in our congregation, and we're so thankful for that. We also saw four people go down in water in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. And so we give glory to God, and I want to thank you for being part of that story. Let me share very quickly two stories, and, and many of you have already heard this, but it's a man named Willie. He and his wife walked into our service about 18 months ago. Uh, his wife only was able to attend one service. Fortunately, thank God, she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on that day. Don't ever walk into a service and take for granted that service. Even if you don't feel an acute need, as Brother Glenn said, when you leave, you may testify of what you saw, what you experienced. Somebody in that service needs something. And it might be someone's last opportunity to engage at the level that they need. And so Sandy received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That left Willie as a 77-year-old widower who had never been to church at all consistently in his life. But he said, I promised Sandy that I would turn my life over to God and I would be faithful to this church because I want to go where she is. And I said, Willie, with an attitude like that, we'll drag you if you have to. You're going to heaven. And so Willie this year was baptized in Jesus' name. He also received the precious baptism of the Holy Ghost. Sunday at 229, he's going to walk through the door. He's going to shake my hand, and there's going to be some cash in that handshake because although he is on a, a senior on a fixed income, every single Sunday he contributes to the Word of God. As we praise and worship God today, he'll, tears will stream down his cheeks. And when he leaves, before he leaves our building today, he'll tell somebody. He'll say this, because if you're around him, if for 15 minutes you'll hear this. If I would have known church people were like this, I would have started long, long ago. Aren't you thankful God saves everybody that wants to be saved, and he ministers to everybody? Ramona, I'll call her that. She's a lady from our clinic. One of the three ladies that, uh, the three people, pardon me, that received the baptism of the Holy Spirit received it at West Cancer Center. She represents the second person who's been filled with the Holy Ghost in our cancer center, in our, in our rooms there. So pray for me that I don't get kicked out of my job before God wants me to. But right now, we have a revival center on 7945 Wolf River Boulevard where people receive chemotherapy, but they also receive spiritual therapy. And the Lord is filling people with the Holy Ghost there. Ramona was turned to child prostitution at age 13. She became addicted to crack cocaine and spent 13 years of her life bound by that addiction. But in 2004, the Lord turned her life around, and she began a walk of recovery with Jesus Christ. She repented of her sins. She professed faith in Jesus Christ, but she did not yet have the baptism of the Spirit. And as the first day that I met Ramona, God had cleared out my entire clinic. The persons before her and after her did not show up for their appointments. It was very unusual. I had a nurse that did not show up that day. It was very unusual. My entire hallway was cleared away, and you've got to be stupid to not know that God's moving when something like that happens. I'm not very spiritual, so the Lord helps me. And I said, something's going on. And she looked at me, and she said, can we pray? And she just held out her hands and, and, uh, and, and you know, Brother Steve, you don't have to be a, a very good prophet to understand that. I said, oh, yes, we'll, we'll pray. And God's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. And so I just talked to her a little bit about what that was. And she lifted her hands. And sure enough, she just started talking in tongues. I thought she was going to never stop. Some of my other patients showed up. We needed the room, but she was having a Holy Ghost time. Now, she was kind about it. She'd get worked up, start kicking around and knocking over a few things. And she'd settle back down and say, I, I, I've got to control myself. i gotta, I got to gotta get it under, under wraps here. Y'all know how that is. Some of y'all are crazy when the Lord hits you. But she was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she told me in her follow-up visit, she said, I had to tell my family, I had to tell my sister, you've got to get this that I received. She said, I had to tell my pastor that this is something different. The love of God is on me in a way that it's never been on me. Aren't you thankful for an experience that is real? It's available. We don't have to have a 3,000-voice choir. We don't have to have a 20,000-square-foot facility. Wherever we are, 
God can move. Would you stand to your feet with me and let's just worship the Lord. Let's thank him for what he's going to do. He's going to move in these discipleship meetings Wednesday night. We're going to learn how we can share this gospel wherever we are and Jesus can break through into our relationships. It may be your boss that receives healing this next week. It may be the person that you work with whose marriage is restored. It may be the grandmother down the street who receives healing from arthritis. You never know what God is going to do if you allow him to sanctify a relationship. So let's pledge to do that together in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 5. I'm aware of the time, and believe me, I, I've got to get down and load up equipment. because That's what bivocational pastors and church planners do. So uh, we'll, there's a hard stop. <laughs> Don't be worried today, but I, I am so thankful for this opportunity to stand before you and deliver what I believe the Lord wants us to share together. First Peter chapter 5, a, a very familiar portion of Scripture, and it contains a number of principles, and we could spend an entire month in Bible study on it and not unpack it all. But I want to pick up one theme today and with the Holy Spirit's help, drive home a point. And I just want to say from the beginning today, there is suffering in life, but there's also life after suffering when you live in Christ. Everybody suffers. Everybody suffers. But not everybody succeeds. Everybody gets broken. But not everybody gets blessed. Everybody gets cursed. Everybody gets crushed. But not everybody gets consecrated. And we've got an opportunity through the infusion of the healing power of the Spirit for every circumstance to fall underneath God's sovereignty. And when that happens, good things begin to roll into the life of a Christian. It's a hopeful faith. It's a glorious gospel. And God has given us some powerful things. Listen to what his word says here. Peter says in verse 6 of chapter 5, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you, in due time. If you've got to be low, make sure you're under God's hand because humility has an upward trajectory. If you'll place yourself under the hands of God, good things are in your future because he makes sure that those that are under his hand are protected. Casting all your care on him for he cares for you. It is a word that implies throwing about a heavy fishing net. Remember, Peter was a muscular fisherman. He wasn't one of these guys who went out and just tossed a little a little fishing rod with a little lure on it. These were heavy 40-pound nets that he would throw out onto the water time and time again to catch these fish. And that word cast means to literally forcefully throw it from you. You can't just wake up on Monday and say, Lord, I hope you take care of my day and pray your little Instagram prayer with your devotional cup sunlit with a right filter. You've got to get down to business with God and throw some things off of you and throw them onto him, and he will take care of it. He will take care of it. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil's a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. I will make no, no apologies today for saying there is an enemy of your soul. But I also make no apologies for saying he is defeated when you resist him and submit to God. Be, be sober, be vigilant, but resist him steadfastly in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It rains on the just and the unjust, so quit pouting. My grandmother used to say, grab your bootstraps and pull yourself up. I know you're hurting. I don't mean to make light of that, but it, everybody hurts. But we heal because he's inside of us. Praise God. The God of all grace has called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered, everybody say after. After you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, settle you. Storms don't last, but in the aftermath, God's got some treasures for his people. God's got some good things for those that are willing to hang on. If you'll just get a little backbone in your spirituality, and if you'll just get a little white knuckle in your walk with God, and if you'll just get a little flint in your face and you'll say, Lord, it doesn't matter tomorrow if the sun is shining or if the storm clouds are rolling, 
I'm going to be here because you're going to be here and we're going to get through this together. When you're done going through your storm, God's going to do some great things in your life. Come on, let's lift our hands right now and let's proclaim that prophetically over this place today. Lord, I speak to the discouragement. I speak to the, to the woundedness. I speak to the fatigue and the tiredness and, and the depression, God, and I command it to leave in the name of Jesus and open a space right now for your word to take place in our hearts and to show us to show us what you desire. In the name of Jesus, praise the Lord. The aftermath, you may be seated. You may be seated. The aftermath, the aftermath, the aftermath. We just endured a snow and ice storm that by my count, now I'm no meteorologist, but it was said to be the worst in three decades. They say you got to go back to 94 in the ice storm before we had anything this bad. This is Beale Street. It is usually filled with drunk people who need the Lord. But on this day, there's not a drunk soul in sight. And I guess the only person that needed the Lord is the person holding that camera because there's snow on Bill Street. This is my uh, little getaway or hideaway for the boys and, and I, and Jana tolerates it, but we love to go there and we've, we love to just mess around. And that's a little farm. And that's the great thing about where we live is it's, it's both. It's, it's urban and it's rural. This is a place where I work, the top floor, and the top floor is covered with snow. All that's beautiful, and, and snow is pretty till you run around in it and everything. But how many know that storms are not only impressive, but they can also do damage? This is a, this is a young man's truck. <clears throat> Two of them were injured. The red truck uh, owned by a college kid. He slept through the entire thing. That's what college people do, sleep through everything including finals, but uh, <coughs> this tree was laden down with ice and snow, and the branch cracked, and it, it crushed that truck. I don't know if it's told or not, but it's certainly damaged. That young man, when he awakened, and his roommate said, something's happening outside, there's a gunshot going on. Went outside and found that there was aftermath. Anybody ever had to clean up after a storm? In the natural, not a trick question, you ever had to clean up after a storm? Limbs, trash. Storm came one time. There's all kind of trash through my, my yard. The neighbors apparently didn't have their trash in bags, you know, and it just it just scattered stuff everywhere. Simple, Colin, just an inconvenience, but it was cleanup nevertheless. Some cleanup is an inconvenience. Some cleanup take your lifetime. There are some storms that you deal with the rest of your life, the aftermath, because it just leaves destruction. In its wake. I hope this young man has insurance. If he don't, if he doesn't, he can, he can pay for that truck. It, it may take a while, but there's an aftermath to deal with. The word comes from Old German, and it has to do with a second mowing of grass and hay. Before they had John Deere's, they had thing called sias or scythes, and, and they would walk through, and they would swing those long blades through the, the amber waves of grain, if you will, and they would cut it down. But Amy, that word aftermath means it after you've gone through, there's a few stalks that you missed, and there's a second cutting. Well, they'll come back, and they'll make sure they get those second stalks. And, and that's sometimes how storms are. It, it seems that storms are not content to cut through your, your productivity and your, your hope and, 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 and what you had hoped to, to gain. It's not content sometimes with storms to cut through once, but there's a cruelty to it, and some storms seem to come back a second time and just and just cut through again and, and there's an aftermath that comes through where you, you wonder if there's going to be one shock of grain that's left standing in your life. One 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 parcel of peace, one 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 cup full of hopefulness and, and one thimble full of faith when the storm is over. Storms bring destruction, chaos, mess and shambles and some point though, when you get through the shock and the awe, the day after you start to dig out. You, you, you come out the door and you, you shovel a sidewalk or you, you take the tree limbs out and you look around and you see if the aerial is off the roof or how many shingles are off. And you look and see if your car is okay and you, you, you determine what the damage is. You do an assessment. There's a calculation of what's left after math. You do some math and figure what the damage is going to be. How long is it going to take me? How expensive is it going to be to deal with what the storm left me. While you're doing that, though, if you're a person of covenant, you'll listen in life 
you'll hear a still small voice, and it'll be God. And he's going to speak to you. Elijah was in a cave, and there was a storm. But after the storm, in the aftermath, he heard a still small voice. Because God is not only the God of standing grain, He's the God of bruised reeds. He's not only the God of health and healing, He's the God of circumstance and struggle. He's not only the God of what you have, He's the God of what you have left. He's not only the God of your past, He is the God of your present circumstance, and He's the God of your future tomorrow. I want to encourage you today because no matter what it looks like, listen to me, listen to me. It may not be for you today, but it will be for you before you go to heaven because everybody goes through storms. It rains on the just and the unjust. But if you're in the aftermath today, I want to give you a nugget of hope that you can take home with you, and that is this. If you're standing in the mess, it means the storm is over. The aftermath doesn't come until after the storm is over. And the aftermath, no matter how messy, no matter how much damage, no matter how much destruction, it means that the clouds are gone and you are free to begin the process of restoration. I want to encourage a weak Christian today. I want to encourage someone who's been buffeted today. I want to encourage someone who's heard Satan this week telling you that you can't make it, that the storm is going to last forever. And I want to tell you that storms have an expiration date. Storms don't as long as they want to. Storms God is sovereign. Whether and when it goes, the master of the wind speaks, and the winds have to obey. On earth, storms end. September 5th, 1831, there was an astronomer, a stargazer. He pointed his telescope in the night sky, and he saw something amazing. He saw what I'm showing you. He saw a planet. Anybody know which planet this is? Well, I think our chief of the department over there knows and heard some echoes. Jupiter, by Jove, the Romans would say. Here's Jupiter. Anybody know what that red spot is? Thank you, Brother Curtin. This section over here is doing pretty good today. Playing trivia, they walk out with a coffee cup. It's five miles high. Higher than Everest. That red dot is 30% larger than this entire planet. That is one whale of a storm, and it has been going on at least 300 years, 300 years, so much that when you went to school, they showed you that red dot, and that's how you knew when you had to name the, what used to be the nine planets, you, you knew if you saw the red dot, it's Jupiter, because that storm was constant. The storm, Chad, was constant. Winds, 268 miles per hour. We don't even have a hurricane category for that. Faster than any wind ever recorded on this earth. The storm on Jupiter. A continuous storm for three centuries. Do you know why? You know why storms don't stop on Jupiter? Because Jupiter is all water. John, there's not a speck of land on Jupiter. But you should exalt your Lord today because you don't live on Jupiter. The ninth verse of your Bible, the third day of creation, God assured you that your storms would stop. Because on that day, Brother Steve, the Bible says that he separated the water from the land. And that geologic creative act ensured that forever on this earth, as long as a storm comes, it will blow itself out because it cannot maintain the low atmospheric pressure required to continue being a storm. I don't know if there have ever been life on Jupiter, but those people don't have the promise that we have today if they ever lived. But I will tell you this, earthlings can stand flat-footed and say this storm will not last, but I will. Proverbs 10 and 25 says that after the storm has passed, 
the wicked will disappear, but the righteous remain forever. Somebody ought to take some encouragement. Lord, today, the storm is swept by, the wicked are gone, the righteous stand firm forever. The word promises you that you can last longer because storms stop. Peace be still. It's not a suggestion from an effeminate, long-haired, long-eyelashed, robe-flowing Jesus with a light on his head. He is a strong master, and when he commands, storms have to pay attention. I'm talking to somebody right now that your circumstance is not determinative in your life. Your sovereign Lord is determined in your life. And we need to lift our eyes a little bit and get it off the horizon and beyond the clouds and look at the one who rides on the clouds. His name is Jehovah. I'll say it again. When storms step in your life, it means you, you will never face anything that he doesn't come to help you with. I will not deny it because I've been through some storms. Pastor, I have sat, I, I finished some days at work and opened my door, walked into an empty house and gone down on the floor like an animal rolling around and writhing and crying in pain. And I have prayed night after night after night that God would not allow me to wake up because the storm was so severe and the aftermath was so ugly that I didn't want to live anymore. I'm not preaching from a theology textbook today. I'm preaching from the only book that matters, and I'm telling you that the book of life and the book of the Word of God have shown me that storms can lead devastation, but God leaves us something more than devastation in the aftermath. God makes sure that when you go through the storm, there is a purpose in what he allows you to experience. And there is a, a sovereign need of God that is met through our faithfulness in our circumstance. And he has a way of bringing out beauty through the ashes and joy through the morning. And he brings out dancing instead of the sackcloth. Won't deny it. Storms are awful. I hate them. They can wreck what is built by man. They can, they can destroy things. This is a picture of a storm from 2004. It's Hurricane Jean. As Gulf Coast storms go, it's very large, as you can see. It covered the entire tip of Florida all the way up to the panhandle over the Caribbean. It was hundreds of miles wide. Brother Streeter, it wasn't extremely powerful. Winds got up to 40 miles an hour only. It's category one or two. And, 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 and it did about, in today's dollars, about $700 million worth of damage, which if you were Lloyds of London would bother you. But on an individual basis, as a hurricane goes, it's not tremendously damaging. But there was one person that took advantage of Hurricane Jean. Joel Ruth was a beachcomber, and he had a metal detector. And one thing he knew, Brother Walker, is that storms stir. And it changes the way you look at things. And he recognized that aftermath is not always negative. Sometimes there's treasure found among the junk. Sometimes when you're looking at the devastation, you find something that's worth a celebration. And sometimes when it's the day after the storm, it's a time when you can discover something that will alter your destiny. Joel Ruth was walking along the beach after Hurricane Jean because what he knew was when the tide turns and the waves crash and when the winds blow, things get unearthed. And he heard something go beep, beep, beep on his metal detector and he looked down. There were 180 Spanish doubloons that had been wrecked over 200 years ago in 17. 
15. The combined worth of those pieces of eight was $40,000. And he, because he was willing to walk through the aftermath, he walked away with a treasure. I want to say to somebody today that Satan is in your storm, but so is your Lord. And Satan is trying to destroy some things in you, but God is looking to shift some things in you. And Satan wants to decrease your value, but God has a sovereign purpose of increasing your value. And if you take a walk with the one who rules the winds and the one who rules the waves, you'll find some things in your life. We read it today, after you've suffered for a while. After. Dana, after. After you've suffered for a while. You know what that means? You know how long a while is, Kurt? A while is as long as God wants it to be. It is not as long as my enemy wants it to be. It's not as long as Satan wants it to be. It's not as long as my friends think it might be. It's not as long as my counselors might advise me it may be. A while is there until God is finished with it. And then when he says enough, the storm has to leave. And after you have suffered a while, the Bible gives us four promises. Number one, he's going to perfect us. He's going to perfect us. How many times I've called to God and I said, God, I've been dumb again. I've been stupid again. I did it again. I said it again. I thought it again. I heard it again. I, whatever I did, Lord, God, I'm so sick of this. Would you please help me to be more sanctified? Would you please perfect me, God? And God says, wait a minute. There's a storm coming. But when you get out of the storm, you're going to be made perfect because I've got a purpose in the storm, and that purpose is perfection. I'm going to establish you. I'm going to settle you, and I'm going to strengthen you. The storm may shake the thing that are weak, but it cannot shake the impenetrable trait of a person of God who is standing in covenant. And after the storm is over, you can be established, you can be strengthened, and you can be settled in the Word of God. Stand with me today. I'd like to talk about the God of all peace today. I'd like to talk about the God of all comfort. I'd like to talk about the Prince of Peace that gives a peace that passes understanding. I'd like to talk about the one who knows about trouble today and how to bring out of tribulation a glorious crown of life. I, I'd love to spend a lot of time today breaking down how rich are the promises of the Word of God are, but I want you right now just to focus on these four. God is going to make me perfect through my storm. The enemy's purpose is not going to be realized through my circumstance. Realize that when Jesus went to the wilderness, it wasn't a physical storm, but it was a spiritual storm for 40 days. The Bible says in one place that he was led of the Spirit, Brother Streeter. The led of the Spirit. And in another place, it says that the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Brother Steve, it is entirely possible that the Holy Spirit and a satanic spirit are taking me to the same place but they have entirely different purposes that what the enemy can I break it down this way what the enemy meant for evil God meant for good Joseph said I'm standing in the aftermath but in the aftermath yes my, my, my rule in my father's family has been destroyed. My, my, my shepherding has been destroyed. My, my life as a dreamer, my coat is bloody and gone. But, I, but, I, but now I, I wear a signet ring that controls all of Egypt. And my family is going to be saved because God sent me here to preserve life. The Messiah is going to come from out of my loins because I was faithful in my circumstance. And Jehovah, who is sovereign, has seen to it that his purpose was glorified in me. Paul said when we suffer with him, we're glorified with him. Paul said when we endure suffering, we're qualified to reign. James said when we're steadfast under trials, we'll receive a crown of life. Peter said when our faith is tested by the fire of suffering, it results in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. Do not finish your story before the author speaks to your storm. Don't close when he's dipped it in the ink and he's still writing with a hand that has scars on it. Don't stop when the sovereign Lord 
neurology and steps out of theology and starts doing something special in your life regarding your circumstance. Because when he's finished, it's not going to not be just about the suffering. It's going to be about the glory. Suffering, storms, they've got an expiration date. They spoil. But glory is eternal. Paul said it this way. I waited in the balance. And Chad, the affliction seemed light. But the glory seemed heavy. And they lied on me. When they were screaming and cursing me. When they mocked me. When they beat me. I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about Paul. That's happened to me. Some of you, when the doctor said, it's terminal. Find your son. The affliction was light when I waited against the glory. Just a moment, we're to close our eyes. Not everybody's suffering today, but everybody will. For those of you that are suffering, I bring solace. I want to hold your hand. I want to say they're there. I want to pat you on the head and the hand and say it's going to be all right. But I came to bring more than that today. I came to bring a prophetic word. And that is this. God is in your storm. And you will be here with him when the storm is over. Your storm will not last. But your God's providence will. And if you will be faithful to him, you will never find that your faithfulness can even compare to his faithfulness. And your desire for his goodness will never match his desire for your benefit because he is sovereign in the storm. Just a moment, I'm going to open this altar and they're going to sing. I want you to make three declarations to the Lord today. I'm going to give you very specific instructions when you come to this altar. I want you to make three declarations. Number one, my storm is sovereign, not sovereign. My God is sovereign. Number two, my aftermath will be a future full of righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Satan, you believe. You may blame but he's building me a mansion. And so I'm going to be standing with your nun puffing because I know someone who's great. <laughs> well, I feel like saying that again. Somebody ought to have a strong faith right now that Satan can't take away anything that God doesn't give him. Number three, I'm going to praise you in the storm. And I'm going to praise you in the aftermath. Let the wind howl through the rafters. There will be another sound that's lifted above the howling of the wind. And it will be the praise of the saints that says, You are the one who gives. You are the one who takes away. And I trust you. is over, my praise is going to be waiting, God, and I'll beat the birds and I'll beat the sun because I'm there first to praise you because, God, your praise will be continually in my mouth, storming or sunshining. I'm going to praise. These altars are open. Make your declarations because God has already made his declarations. He's going to protect you. He's going to put value in you. He's going to establish you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to protect Time for our declarations to match his. He gave you four promises at the end of the storm. Why don't you come and in the middle of your storm, give him three. God, I'm going to praise you. God, I'm going to trust you. And God, I'm going to believe you that my storm will not last, but my faithfulness will.
That's it. His strong. His faithfulness outweighs the weather. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Jesus. No matter what. I will pray.